So good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first talk of this session. My name is Jeffrey Cross, and this is Zarina from Tokyo Tech. Uh, we were both very pleased to be here. This talk was inspired in part by a talk last year at the Open NDX conference by Andy Sattarelli from Stanford, which was published in the uh, January 20th, 2017 science issue about encouraging MOOC learners in the developing world to complete it by using brief interventions. When I heard that talk, I thought, what about is, what is the relationship between the course content and the learner engagement? In addition, I also exchanged email with Nina Huntman, EDX, uh, edX Director of Academic and Research about MOOC content analysis, and, and was informed that some analysis work was ongoing but not yet available. As a result, we undertook this, uh, this content analysis study of our five EDX MOOCs in order to compare it to EDX uh, MOOCs overall and found the results worth sharing. So Zarina will take, will take over from here. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, edX for the opportunity to present here. And today, uh, my topic, uh, what can be learned from natural language process of MOOCs, is, covers a, a wide range of uh, material. So I hope you will bear with me to, uh, till the end. So uh, let me first give you an idea how our work started. Uh, we developed uh, five edX courses uh, on our platform, and as analytics teams, we were uh, really interested to get answers to these questions like, how can we compare Tokyo Tech uh, MOOCs with other edX MOOCs? Um, so what should be the parameters of the comparison? Also, we uh, want, were wondering how should we structure the course content? So uh, sometimes it's uh, very important uh, from the learner perspective to align the course content. So whether the video should go first, how, uh, how long the sequence of video should be in the course, and questions like that. Uh, we also uh, had the learner experience data in terms of the feedback. So, for example, some of the students or and learners they commented that the course content was very interesting, was very interesting, but at the same time it was hard to understand. So, having these questions in mind and user feedback, uh, we decided to uh, analyze the course content. So, the goal of our analysis was to identify the course design, delivery, and content-related elements. Uh, which might improve MOOC quality and a learner experience. So here's an outline of my talk. First, I would like to uh, briefly describe the state, current state of MOOC analysis. Uh, then I would like to introduce our uh, tool we developed, which enabled us to uh, analyze the content. After that, I will describe some statistical uh, features we were able to extract from the crawl data. And finally, I will um, explain that NLP te techniques we applied for our analysis. 
So, um, in our team, uh, we categorized research in MOOCs uh, into several categories and identified two major ones. So, uh, the first category uh, is concerned on analyzing learner activity data. So, uh, for the purpose of uh, predicting dropouts, for example, or for the purpose of providing adaptive real support for learners. Um, and other uh, approach to uh, MOOC analysis is based on the course content analysis. Uh, so, uh, so this course content analysis can be applied to a wi wide range of uh, applications. For example, um, many researchers are wondering how to do content classification of MOOCs uh, or do content matching. These types of uh, problems are useful. For example, uh, if you look at the dashboard or uh, if you look at the forum of uh, MOOCs, so sometimes it's necessary to structure the data. So how would you do that? How, how you, can you apply automatic techniques to do this? Um, and uh, what we, um, what our research focus lies on, on is on the second approach, so the con content analysis of the MOOCs, and we apply NLP techniques. but. Um, uh, NLP research in MOOCs uh, covers, might cover a wide range of topics, so we just want to present one technique we used, and this technique is called the word embedding. So uh, in traditional NLP, uh, words are represented as uh, IDs, so uh, or one hot, uh, they have one hot representation. So this kind of representation doesn't give much of value to the training model. Uh, that's why the word embedding model, it um, captures a uh, similarity between the words by, map by assigning a, a vector representation to words and mapping them closer into the vector space. So the advantages of this approach is that, uh, as I said, the model is able to capture semantic similarity. Um, the model is much faster to train because the, the matrix uh, for words is not sparse, sparse anymore and the human effort for training is minimal. So it can be considered as an unsupervised learning approach. Okay, uh, so now let me uh, give an overview of the fir my further talk. So I will first explain uh, the crawler we developed, which enabled us to extract MOOC data, MOOC textual content. Uh, then I will proceed into a statistical analysis and what statistical analysis uh, enabled us to extract is uh, the design and the delivery methods. For example, the core structure and lecture uh, style. Uh, and after that, I will proceed into uh, NLP analysis, which enabled us to extract contextual elements, such as readability and section coherence. So um, our MOOC crawler, um, it's, we call it uh, Tokyo Tech edX MOOC crawler. It's a Python-based um, tool developed for mining textual data from MOOCs um, on the user dashboard. And we were particularly interested in three types of components, a uh, text component or HTML component, a video component, um, and we extracted uh, transcripts from video component, and a quiz or assessment component. Uh, our uh, crawler uh, is able to extract this information and save in a JSON format. Uh, this JSON format also uh, can capture the hierarchical structure of uh, MOOC organizations. So you can see that, uh, for example, the, text, uh, the JSON for text component has uh, some information about um, uh, where the content, uh, uh, what is the content, which section and subsection it belongs to, and some other extra information. Uh, in, the, in the similar manner, v video component JSON has information about uh, section and subsection it belongs to, the transcript data, uh, and some uh, other extra information like the video duration and the link uh, in YouTube. So uh, if you're interested in our uh, tool implementation, you can check out uh, uh, implementation in GitHub, and we'll, we'll be looking forward for your feedback. Okay, now I'll proceed into statistical analysis uh, of the crawl data. So we were able, uh, using the crawler tool, we were able to extract 308 uh, edX MOOCs, um, and we uh, filtered them out using uh, the following features. So uh, language, 
uh, which is English, availability. Uh, we crawled only archive courses since these are the courses which provide uh, the whole content uh, of the course. And uh, we filtered based on the seven subjects, our, some of which are business management, computer science, and humanities, and so on. And we decided to compare these uh, ex extracted courses with the Tokyo Tech uh, MOOCs. Uh, so two of, uh, in total there are five MOOCs, two of which are courses in English. Um, two courses are in Japanese and one course, um, two courses are both in Japanese and English and one course in Japanese. Uh, so we decided to look at some statistical information of the extracted uh, of the extracted courses, and we were able to find that even though we crawled uh, courses based on the seven categories I mentioned before, uh, there were total in total 28 subjects, and this was due to the fact that. Um, uh, that course developers might specify several related subjects uh, of the course when they upload the course. Uh, and um, top one subject was computer science, uh, followed by business and management, engineering, engineering, social science, and math. Here, uh, Tokyo Tech covers a wide range of topics, uh, from social science and history to uh, architecture and electronics. Uh, we also looked at the distribution of institutions uh, in our crawl data and found out that there are totally uh, 78 different institutions. And top five institutions uh, are MIT, Microsoft, Harvard, Harvard Delft, and IMB. IMB. And Tokyo Tech here uh, ranked as 11th, uh, which which is quite a surprising uh, we, uh, since we only have five courses. Um, so after we crawled the data, we also decided to look at the course uh, content structure. So as I mentioned before, we were focused on three, primarily on three types of components, uh, text, uh, video, transcript, and assessment components. And then uh, we decided to see how different institutions, how different courses align uh, these components. And here, uh, for example, you can see uh, courses from th uh, two institutions, Tokyo Tech and Harvard. And uh, the cells here represent the component, and uh, y-axis represents the section uh, which these components belong to. So in Harvard, for example, you can see a clear pattern. They um, start, they prefer to start the uh, sections with, with uh, a sequence of video component and end their uh, sections with the sequence of assessments. However, if you look at the Tokyo Tech courses, there is uh, no such preference here, and all of the video, uh, video text, and assessment component is, is distributed um, evenly across the co course. Uh, so after that, uh, this kind of diagram show, uh, show gives a good representation of the content uh, distribution, but it doesn't uh, say how much content is within each component. So that's why we decided to um, a look at uh, how much uh, content is in uh, each of the uh, each of the component, and we identified that uh, based on the word count. So we are able to uh, identify that there are 75 courses which uh, which are video based, and uh, if we cluster these uh, courses using uh, K-means clustering, we can further uh, subdivide it into three groups, uh, which we can. I'll call as strongly video based with 90% uh, of the video con of the content in video uh, and um, uh, uh, like um, less videos less strongly video based courses and uh, two of the Tokyo Tech courses here uh, belong to the first cluster so since we identified that video uh, are very um, important, they are a very important part of uh, content here, we decided to look at what is the average video duration, and we were able to find that um, the average uh, duration r ranges from three to nine minutes. And uh, all, all of the Tokyo Tech courses here, uh, four of the Tokyo Tech courses, they lie in this range except for one course, which is modern Japanese architecture. We also looked at the speaking rate um, 
of video lectures and found out that the average speaking rate is about 2.3 words per second. And uh, the fastest speaking lecture uh, was, uh, was from the course named Introduction to Public Speaking with a speaking rate of about uh, four words per second. And the slowest uh, speaking lecture was uh, uh, from the course More Fun with Prime Numbers with a speaking rate of one word per second, which I found really low. Uh, okay, so we're done with the statistical information. Now let's move on to NLP analysis. Mm. So why we decided to uh, measure um, the course comp uh, components uh, when we try to um, compare the course component with each other, we, we had to have some measure. Uh, so that's why we come up with the doc to vec model. Uh, which allows us to represent documents as vectors and apply um, a vector opera operations to um, map uh, and to identify the similarity between these courses. So the uh, DocTovec model uh, works like this. So as, in, as the input documents, you ha we have courses. And uh, as an output, we have the vector representation for the courses. And we can apply the uh, similarity, cosine similarity measure to measure how, uh, how similar is the content of uh, courses. Um, so the, the model is um, very available. So we use the GenSIM implementation for, uh, to train the model. And uh, we obtain these word vectors uh, and document vectors for each course, but then we needed to identify how meaningful are these vectors and uh, how, uh, whether we can u apply them for further analysis. So we des decided to classify uh, the courses and, uh, into three categories. So humanities, uh, social science, and business and management. And the classification result uh, sh uh, showed a high uh, accuracy, uh, so uh, the accuracy of 80%, which, uh, which allowed us to confirm that the vectors which the model extracted were quite meaningful. Um, so, and further, we decided to um, capture similarity between co course sections instead of uh, course overall, and uh, apply this kind of approach to extend MOOC readability analysis. So now instead of mapping uh, documents or courses as vectors, we are looking at section content and uh, map it as a vector. So uh, we organize all the contents together um, into one section uh, here. And uh, we uh, choose two measures for comparison. So one measure is a pairwise comparison, another measure is a linear wise comparison, and by pairwise comparison, I mean that uh, each, each section is being compared to every other section. Uh, in linear comparison, we compare first section to the second uh, section, and then afterwards we compare sec second section to the third section, and so on. So our assumption here was that uh, co comparing courses in a linear manner should give us a uh, should give a higher score compared to comparing courses in our uh, course sections in a random manner. And this kind of assumption was supported by the real uh, data. So here, uh, you, um, here, here you can see a pairwise cosine and linear uh, cosine similarities for about, uh, for more than 200 courses. And our y-axis here represents the similarity. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, orange distribution here is a linear similarity, and uh, the, the blue line here is the pairwise similarity. So, and you can clearly see that the uh, mean of, uh, the, of the linear simula similarity, which is in red, is much higher than the mean of the pairwise similarity, which means that uh, when we compare sections based on the, their vector representations, uh, so the, these vector representations have, uh, they do capture some meanings uh, from, from the content. So how can we um, apply this kind of uh, section similarity using word embeddings in, into uh, content analysis and measuring the readability? So um, 
we decided to um, uh, use two parameters for that. So one of the parameter is a flash Kincaid reading ease. It's a, it's a formula wide, widely used in uh, educational fields even nowadays. Uh, so it states how readable and how easy uh, the text is to read. So for example, uh, in the range of zero to 100, um, very, um, di very difficult uh, content would have a very low score and very um, easy content would have a higher score. So th this uh, formula uh, manipulates the t uh, like f uh, two measure measures, so how lengthy are the sentences and how lengthy are the words, which means that um, here if the sentences are quite lengthy, the score would be lower, and if the words are lengthy, then the, the score would get lower. So um, another measure we used is the cosine similarity between courses, and uh, here we decided to represent courses uh, as uh, graphs, where uh, each section is represented in a, as a node, and a section's re readability score or reading is, is represented as a radius of uh, each section. So the higher the uh, readability score, the uh, easier the uh, section is to read. And we also uh, mapped, uh, we also designed the link um, as a course, course similarity, because the cosine similarity here, uh, the green link means that the high similarity or, and the um, uh, red link means that there is a, uh, there is a less similarity which the model was able to capture. Um, so we also looked at, uh, so one of the interesting insights here is that um, the content of introduction and conclusion sections are very easy to read. You can see the radius are, radiuses are quite uh, large. And uh, the contents of introduction and conclusion sections are, is less coherent with the content of the rest of the course. And we also examined this kind of uh, pattern f uh, with other courses. And we found that, um, for example, in out of edge course, the readability uh, was quite consistent. Um, however, in a, a modern Japanese architecture, we couldn't find the, the pattern which was consistent f with the courses. So we found the we weird phenomenon that the conclusion section was very, had very low readability score. And when we looked inside the content, we saw that um, the section contains a, a lot of a long sentences which carry um, with the content, which is not very hard to understand, but still it gives a high, uh, read high readabil low readability score, which means that uh, the section is hard to read. Um, so what kind of application this kind of uh, uh, modeling can provide? Uh, first of all, it can provide a feedback on content uh, and development stage. So it can ident easily identify which sections are less readable compared to others, and uh, so that the content developers of the course can uh, easily fix that. And also, this kind of modeling can uh, support efficient learning. So suppose uh, the user, uh, the learner, uh, has a problem understanding the content of uh, this section, then um, the the word embedding model and, and document embedding model can uh, can propose um, can pro can propose a, a course with a similar structure and uh, the section with a similar content. So uh, the implications of our research is that uh, now uh, being uh, being able to get the features and uh, the feedback during the analysis process, we can uh, run the development and analysis process uh, concurrently. Um, so the purpose, of, um, the, the purpose of our analysis was to identify the features to comp uh, for comparing Tokyo Tech courses with other courses. And what we learned is that uh, most of the content is video-based. Uh, readability analysis can be used uh, for developing cohesive and learner-friendly content. And also the combination of MOOC features can be applied to, pre 
predict course popularities given other uh, information, for example, uh, learner activity data. Uh, and in the future work, we, we are planning to continue uh, this analysis and present uh, to present at a JSET conference in Japan in September 2018. Uh, we are also welcome, welcoming collaborations on more content analysis and uh, looking forward for the feedback. Thank you for your attention. When you're crawling the archived courses, I, I believe edX hides all of the information in show answer um, things for problems. So uh, that suggests to me that you might be missing a fair chunk of courses, especially ones that had lengthy uh, solutions. Uh, were, you, were you able to get that information? Uh, could you yeah. repeat the first part? Uh, when, when edX archives a course, mm -hmm. the show answer button on a problem disappears. Show X? Show answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can't see the solutions to the problems anymore. Oh, uh, was, was that information missing from your analysis? Yeah, uh, so basically we crawled, uh, w so this show answer uh, information is provided when the uh, learner is actor interacting with the content, right? We were not interacting with the content. We were um, getting the content as it is. So, but you, so you, you, you were just grabbing this, the screen yeah. data, basically? Yes. Okay, so you weren't actually seeing any of the solutions, which may actually comprise a substantial portion of text for a course. Yeah, so basically we didn't look uh, at the solutions yet. Okay. Um, as, as a follow-up, uh, would you be interested in uh, asking people for their uh, studio exports of the XML? Uh, so you could actually get the entire uh, content of a course in, in one go without having to do crawling. Uh, and then you'd have all of the information associated with the course. Oh, so would I be interested in uh, crawling the... The XML data. XML data. Uh, the, the raw data that goes into making the course as opposed to having to crawl it off web pages where you may not get, may not get everything. Yeah, we would be interested in that data as well, but uh, we weren't, we did not have access to this data. data. Okay. Um, when you uh, implemented the word to vec uh, similarity, I assume you did it based on the uh, word embedding model that you described earlier. Uh, which model? The word embedding. Yeah, word embedding yeah. model. So. I'm just curious, how did you actually train word embedding? So uh, we used the GenSim implementation. Uh, mm -hmm. So you provide a raw input as course text, and the model is able to uh, learn the uh, word embeddings. And uh, so... Uh, so do you know it, if it was based on co-occurrence of words? Yeah, so okay. the, the, the architecture behind the model is, uh, it looks at the pair of words and um, tries to identify which of words are appearing more frequently in the same context. So this is how, uh, if the two words have a higher chance of uh, um, appearing to, together, then they, they are mapped closer in the vector space. Mm -hmm. so Thank you. And uh, a second question. Uh, so when you use the flash Kincaid measure, um, because of the specific context of a course, sometimes it's a very special topic, you obviously can have situations when there is a lengthy word, so that, according to Flash Kincaid, drives the readability way down. But if it's a word that's repeated in that course 50,000 times, or you know, it's just a central to understanding of the course, it probably should not count that much. Uh, did you like, try to explore that, like maybe introduce some corrections to Flash Kincaid? Yeah, so we were uh, also concerned about the, this, and we were uh, proposing to build a vocabulary list, a vocabulary list for each course, which um, might filter or neglect this kind of uh, lengthy words. Um, but we haven't implemented this yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
so I was mostly interested in um, what kind of lessons for your course development have you learned from this? Like, are there any big rules where before this analysis you were thinking one thing worked, but after you've done it you've realised actually this, we need to follow this rule to make our courses better? Like, are there any things like that you've found? So uh, what we really wanted to, um, we wanted to be able to compare courses with each other and find some, identify some metrics. Uh, however, when we looked at the content, we, um, we were able to grab some uh, features so, such as the readability or um, the video length, for example. But of oh, Currently, we are not able to say how meaningful are these features uh, for course comparison because we do not correlate this data with the learner activity. Yeah, going back to your question, for example, on modern Japanese architecture, um, we, we've gotten posts on the discussion board, this course is really difficult. Uh, it's difficult to read, the language is hard to understand, that type of thing. But before we did this type of analysis, we, we received comments, but we didn't really realize how difficult it was. So it's, it's, it, it's listed as an introduction to modern Japanese architecture, but uh, some of the text is actually graduate level, so it's, it's kind of misplaced. So if we would do this again, we would probably try to simplify the text and make the sentence shorter and easier to read or easier to understand. It's the instructor's style of speaking that was captured in the course. I was just curious if you found that sections that had a high similarity score also had similar readability scores. Uh, we didn't look at that uh, data, but uh, so as you can see here, some of the sections have high readability. So first and uh, here, first and uh, second sections, but they have uh, uh, low uh, similarity score. Yeah, because I could imagine if say a student is struggling on a section, you could find another section that was very similar but had a higher readability score that might help them with the, y the yeah, section they're having yeah. trouble with. So yeah, this was one of the ideas behind it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, did you consider looking at the video transcripts as well? Or was this based on only the text available in the course? Oh, so this, uh, we, we concentrated on video transcript data only. Oh, it's only video transcript. Video transcript. Okay, I mean video transcript plus HTML content and quiz content. Okay. Okay. And then my second question was, uh, how do you determine uh, syllables in a word? Oh, the, uh, so we use the packages, available packages for okay, computing so readability scores. I see. Are all those the questions we have today? Okay. Thank you very much for Thank attention. You.
Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today we'll be talking about global learning uh, and discussing social impact and social responsibility. Our presenter is Krishan Mitu, one of the founders of Perversity. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon. It's almost the afternoon now, isn't it, today? How's everyone finding the conference so far? Come on, I want to see some energy. Like, we're coming up to lunch. Come on, how's everyone doing? Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for taking the time out to join us here at uh, the Open edX uh, conference. And specifically, we're going to be talking today a little about something that's quite close to my heart. It's about really looking at uh, how do we create impact um, in really the truest sense. Because I think, you know, there's very few people that get into education simply because they want to make a quick buck. Yes, we're talking about a trillion dollar market, but clearly there's a lot more out there. Um, what we believe in is that actually, you know, tr in, in truth, at Proversity, we are a for-profit social impact business. So we provide open uh, um, program management. So, uh, so this is literally all the services around online program management is what we deliver. So everything from course instructional design, content production, technological development, and then also learner support. So having this holistic offering is really an embodiment of this social ambition because we really started with the purpose of bridging the gap between education and employability. Now that's very much as we've progressed over the last almost five years, manifested in a number of ways and I'm really delighted to share some real case examples. Also some stuff you can take away because I don't want this to be uh, about us. It's really about helping kind of show the world different ways we can look at using online learning as a way of key, like as a key enabler for a lot of the social challenges we have across the world. So why create social impact? And I think that is, you know, if you think about it, some of you may be from startups, some of you may be from existing companies, some of you may be with existing educational institutions. Um, but I always believe in like the hopeful side of, you know, we're, we're dealing with things like Trump, Brexit, Justin Bieber, you know, we have these huge challenges around us <laughs> where, you know, we must overcome. But actually what's really interesting is, well, why do we want to help? Why do we want to give? And, you know, some people say it's indoctrinated in religion. Some say it's part of culture. I just believe it is very much intrinsic to what it is to be a human and to be a great spirit. Um, so really, to be honest, why we create social impact, I think, is just very much a, a course of the reality of the world we live in and it's kind of a reaction to. Because for me personally, um, I have sort of have been sort of a startup mentor, developed a number, this is my fifth business, and I've got to say the thing I've seen most prevalent as a trend across businesses, the business of the futures are not the ones that simply look at ROI, not simply the ones that are looking for just purely profit. It is the triple bottom line, if you will. It is to do more than just create revenue. You know, if you're looking at a millennial workforce, you know, these, you're talking about workforce, which, yes, has been criticized for a number of things, if you believe the likes of Simon Sinek, but also there is actually real truth in the fact that you've got a more socially conscious generation than has ever been before. Sure, they've had a degree of privilege that other generations have not had, but actually because of that, it's actually been very interesting to see, actually, kind of the, the almost the want and desire to do something more than just take that paycheck home. So what I'm going to actually walk you through is a framework. Um, so when we started Proversity, one of our key things was we believed in that you could create a business that was more than just there for just profit. We started working with enterprises, so the likes of um, WPP, the world's largest advertising agency, with Network Rail, uh, a large infrastructural provider in the UK, and also uh, the Bank of England the second oldest bank in the world. So these are very commercial organizations. So we really got put to task as an operating outfit. So, you know, corporates don't give you any space to really make mistakes. And why should they? You know, they have a huge brand, they've delivered over the years, and they have a certain expectation for excellence. So as a response to this, uh, one of the things we decided to do very early on was really lock down in literally the way our company was built, uh, a series of social mission locks and in order to do that, we needed to understand how our impact would work. So we worked with an organization called MPC, uh, New Philanthropy Capital. Uh, they are the organization that actually regulates pretty much every major charity you've heard of. Um, and they're fantastic, but actually they just walked us through a very quick um, sort of framework to work in. So ultimately, we start at the base, the foundations of the company. So what are the strategic vision? What are we here to do? 
Um, the leadership, this includes the people we bring on as a target leadership, so whether it be advisors or individuals we work with. Um, and ultimately, a case for impact management. So ours was really the one metric we could control. It's what we produce. So we measure impact across everything we do. So it's very much ingrained in our DNA. Um, there's always an understanding of what are the learning outcomes, where are we trying to go, um, and that's kind of developed um, underneath it all. So we've built that into the way we measure things as a business and the way we operate. So what this really means is that it's become a part of our business operating process and it's not a cost to the business. When people try and do social impact measures, it often, I mean, I'm not gonna quote specific organization because it's unfair and perhaps not right, but they often believe that for you to be a socially focused business, it must be the, to the detriment of your business. I personally do not believe that's true. Um, I believe that if you build and set up your business right, then actually, or the way that you deliver your learning right in this case, um, you'll basically be able to have that impact. And it really starts with the first pillar, which is map your th theory of change. So theory of change is really a statement to say that we are gonna create an impact in a certain manner. Um, so really kind of just mapping out all the touch points of your experience and what you're trying to do. So let's take an example. You're providing an online course. Um, you're gonna have a number of learners from uh, that could be you know, university entrance, so they, they're looking for like a pre-development uh, course before they join university, as an example. Well, actually, you should be thinking about, like, actually, where are we sourcing these individuals? Where are they coming from? Are they coming from privilege? One criticism for MOOCs in general has been that, actually, the demographics are almost identical to Ivy League schools today. That does mean we, we've may, we often won't get a fair gender split, we will not get people of different races, and we will not get a fair econ socioeconomic status uh, balance across the cohorts. So for all the lip service that was given when MOOCs exploded on the scene almost 10 years ago, we always talked about democratizing education. The truth is we're not quite get there. So this is something we are beholden to ourselves. So we work with organizations, for example, like the Princess Trust in the UK, who help uh, us reach to uh, individuals that normally would not get seen. Um, so next up is prioritizing what you can measure. So what are the most important things? Is it learner engagement? Is it uh, time on task? So these things are very, very important to think about as we're sort of measuring. And we'll have sort of a few minutes for questions and answers later, so feel free to jump in then. Um, and of course, choose your level of evidence. So how far are you gonna go? So is this about surveys? Is this about actually using discussion forums? The discussion forums in edX are very powerful. You can actually use them in multiple ways. Uh, you can kind of set up channels specifically looking at actually, so you've had this course, what happens next? You know, um, and really sort of what you can also frame is the, the, the time scale in which you're gonna capture data. Because that's the most important thing actually, is thinking about that legacy thereafter. So yes, you've delivered a course, so what? Often people will just launch an online experience and there is no follow-up, there is no community at the end of it and it's something we pride ourselves and one of the reasons why we are trying to focus more on community engagement is so we can capture the touch points, the collaborations, what happens. And you know, I can speak to some beautiful experiences we've had but we can share that in a second. And select your sources and tools. So where are you getting your data from? What tools are you using? So there's insights in edX is one tool. We often back that up with say Google Analytics um, there's various other tools you can use to kind of, um, you know, integrate with and use. So whether it's a Google form or a type form actually is a fantastic experience if you want to try something more mobile focused to help you collect that data as you're going on. And ultimately, um, once you have all these components, you can create a sort of an, a, a measurement strategy and that you kind of employ every time you deploy a course. Uh, and what's really interesting is this will also help you understand, are you making an effective change? So again, some of the metrics we've had in the past is can we help get more female entrepreneurs in Latin America was one of the courses we made uh, about three, three and a half years ago. So actually we were trying to see actually could we um, engage with you know, a group of individuals and do culture change. Um, so that was a theory of change around that was, well actually can we make a difference? Can we, can we despite all the barriers and despite all the limitations of society get around those? So just something to think about. This is an effective framework. Feel free to take a snap. Um, and of course, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to just get in contact us. We'll leave some contact details at the end. So I'm gonna actually show you some of this in practice. So uh, we were very fortunate enough to develop the first MOOC uh, for the uh, University of Oxford, um, which was on edX.org. Um, and we had some amazing success. Um, but I just wanna show you just a quick video as an overview of the project, and we'll just get a little bit tactical about what happened thereafter. Um, so if you can press play.
So it's just two minutes, but uh, uh, it will just give you a good overview of the project and what were the aims. Um, and we'll sort of just enjoy that for a second. Oxford University launched the Blavatnik School of Government in 2010, and it's just got one clear goal, to improve government. And what does that take? It takes educating great people to go into government. It takes a private sector and a civil society and citizens who really understand government and expect more from it and know how to demand more. We'll be starting from a society where nobody has any power. That is anarchy. And we're looking at why strong governments emerge in some places, but not in others. We'll then be studying how identities, norms, narratives, social networks, culture if you like, can influence the development path of any society. Of course, we'll then explore how government policies can either promote or inhibit the benefits of scale and specialization. We'll look at how urbanization, industrialization, foreign aid can influence economic development. And finally, we'll look at how external influences ranging from trade and migration to international rules of governance, military intervention, affect the development path of any country. In the school, we talk about a world better led, better served and better governed. And we see this massive online course as a way to help people across the world, whether they can come to Oxford or not, start learning about how their society can prosper better, how government in their, in their country can work better. Cool. Awesome. So um, that was just a short overview. Can we try and just hit the next slide if possible? Okay, while well we figure out the technicals. Um, so that was actually quite a remarkable project in itself. Um, so this was the University of Oxford's first MOOC. Um, we had some incredible success by the usual metrics you'd imagine from, you know, I think the first course run was well over 40,000 individuals globally, uh, had 180 countries represented. Um, it was just really phenomenal in terms of the breadth of the course. And actually, it's kind of been interesting on our side because we've often developed um, open edX instances for organizations, but then actually to be working with edX directly and figuring out the content design and actually being able to deliver this and then see the impact and just the, the velocity of how people sign up. It just speaks to the quality of edX, I must say more than anything else. So I think what was exciting about the project was that, I mean, in terms of the way that the course was designed, we really, really wanted to focus on that net effect. So the fact that we had learners from all over the world, we really wanted them to almost become their own sort of uh, think tank was really the ultimate end game. But in order to get there, first of all, we had to think about how the, the, we'd organize the sort of discussions. Um, that was very much deliberate in terms of how the course was structured. So this is the thing is like, what I'd always say is when you're building courses and you really want to make that impact is thinking about really what's that vision? How do you want this to play out? Often what people will do is take an existing set of materials, digitize them, put them online. But I'd like to think that we can now move ahead of this. And you know, one thing we're just constantly pushing on, and the reason we're showing this is really to show that there's other ways of working. So the fact that we thought about the discussions and the, the way that people would collaborate in groups during the course experience, but also thereafter, um, was very intentional in terms of the structure of the design. We also have our chief learning officer who will be at our stand today, um, Philippa Hardman. Feel free to reach out to her. She's fantastic and uh, was definitely great counsel through actually the development of this project. Um, and one of the things that was very intentional in literally the way the courses were structured was around problem solving. So again, when it comes to that long tail impact of when people walk away with something, we wanted to actually almost do a culture mindset change. So everything from the way that the motion graphics were designed, it was all about really just helping encourage problem solving. Um, and that's a very sort of, I mean, we are working ultimately with an active learning platform. So really kind of just leaning on those elements of the platform as much as you could is a very good way of doing it tactfully. Um, and then it's all about just stoking the fire. So where this was able to have real impact was actually changing perception and thoughts of the way that governments work for organizations. And so what we've had since, which is really interesting, we've even had people 
um, that have taken this course and have now signed up to you know, some programs we're developing now uh, with the Cabinet Office in the UK. Very similar topic around uh, literally like the, the structure and in this case it's government communications coming up soon. But it was very, very interesting to see that like, people will follow the progress um, and they'll find out because we've often been a, the provider, we're not really at the front of this. But it's just interesting to see that. And I think, again, like just the net effect. And one thing I'd have loved to do is show in some of the discussion forums, but of course we need consent, so unfortunately can't do that. But um, thanks to GDPR, great, I love it. Um, so we're being doing, trying to do things the right way. But what was really interesting is like everything from, hey, I'm coming to a new city, does anyone have advice? Um, to also, well, actually, here's a paper I wrote three years ago on this topic. Please discuss, have some thoughts. So we saw these sort of threads of communication. Um, so what's really amazing is that with 180 countries represented, we were able to bring them all together. So um, this is actually one that uh, we're quite proud of. Um, so we are kind of known for doing sort of one almost uh, pro bono project a year. So when it came back to you know, our sort of theory of change when we started the business, one thing we were thinking about is actually what's the various ways we can actually do projects that help um, individuals like in, th in the most earnest sense. So yes, we measure impact across every project, whether it's our most commercialized, but actually we were actually thinking about, well, what if we could help someone that really would not be able to get access to world-class you know, video production or you know, the technology? So in this case, we were working with, the, uh, with PARTA. They're a, an NGO that works across Africa, working with a number of clinics. Um, we were able to create a series of, of programs specifically to be delivered on mobile. Um, and we're just gonna actually similarly just walk you through a little bit about the project. Um, and it's, it's quite a heartwarming thing. Um, so really the focus here was to actually reduce and mitigate the risk of AIDS. Um, and this is quite uh, close to my heart, so I'm watering up a bit, I'm sorry. Um, but as I grew up, I worked with Bono on uh, developing Product Red, which was to basically take, the fact is we're all consumers. And so what if we could take the idea of consumerism and uh, by simply buying simple products, um, be able to um, generate funds to help people Can with AIDS. And so this is turning full circle where we're going to the end delivery on that. And unfortunately, I lost a close friend as a result of it, but I'd love for you to see this. It takes a service delivery mechanism that can find people who need treatment and retain them in care for life. For HIV programs to reach entire communities for prevention and care, efforts need to be extended beyond clinic doors. We need to build the capacity of the community to become an integral element of the health services. The Be Connected course will introduce you to the purpose and the key principles of clinic CBO collaboration. Join us on this journey of connecting, collaboration, and building successful partnerships. See you soon. Um, are we able to go to the next slide? So um, this was an amazing project because we were working with a series of clinics all across Africa. Now, often um, what's interesting with, what I find interesting actually with um, uh, healthcare above all other industries is that um, there is definitely a culture where actually there isn't as much open sharing uh, as you'd imagine. So what happens in say Tanzania will never get found out in say South, in Cape Town or South Africa. I mean, likewise, if you're in uh, you know in, in in a hospital in in Boston, any sort of issues or challenges that happen don't often get shared quite easily to um, you say a, um, a medical institution say in Europe. Mainly this is down to the fact that one, um, it's, it's a little bit cultural, but also just the, the level of just you know, depth that this industry goes to, to make sure that people can live healthy and sustainable lives is very important. So you know, yes, papers are circulated, but the time it takes to write a paper about a certain challenge and then communicate it takes such a long time. Now if you think about it, we've been able to um, cover literally the, like, you know, quite a large percentage already. We've just started the project. So, we kind of are probably sharing this a bit ahead of where we'd like to be, but I mean, we're already covering you know, South Africa, we've been in Kenya, and it's just been incredible to see what we can do. Because what we've effectively done is linked up a series of clinics all across Africa and allowed them to communicate and collaborate. So we did this pro bono, I mean, a, a few years before, we did a project where we, uh, it was called Box Up Crime. So the idea was to help teach um, young adolescents boxing as a way of keeping them out of uh, correctional institutions. 
Um, and the year after, we were taking, we were working with a housing association to take people that would have been homeless two to three years ago and help them get into social housing. So this is something we always do. So one thing I'd ask for you as an audience, if you do have amazing projects, do get in touch with me. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what we've else, else we've been able to do. So one of the big challenges, of course, working across Africa, and we're talking about real big distances here. I mean, in the way that, you know, there isn't the safe server infrastructure you have in the US, you know. Um, for those that uh, know edX well, Amazon has a phenomenal infrastructure in the US, in Europe, in Asia. It's really ramping up in the Middle East. You know, Israel and uh, Dubai are going to have server setups. So this really means that our ability to, to really throw high quality content around the planet is just going to get better and better. But the problem we have here is we have a lot of intermittent um, issues in terms of um, you know, access to high quality video. So we really, really worked on the streaming setup. So we actually have our own adaptive streaming uh, system we've built into the way we work. And that's something we had to do because frankly, it wasn't uh, possible by any other means. Um, and then, you know, again, looking at the communication aspect, we can literally communicate across Africa now um, key issues and challenges using the power of the discussion forums. We have push notifications as an added service layer, uh, which we provide to any, any partner or anyone that would like it on edX. But uh, what's really great about this, it means we get um, real high engagement when it comes to uh, mobile. And I'd like to make a point about iteration. So iteration is really kind of a core philosophy at Proversity. Yes, we throw up online courses all over the globe, but I would just stress, you're never going to get it right first time. So we made some mistakes and we've been able to improve them. We've got feedback from the learners and we've just cleaned up and improved the product um, and the service we provide. And just please always think about that when you're creating online experiences. It's one thing to get the course online. It's quite a different one to foster an incredible community and create change and impact. Um, and so, actually, how are we doing for time? Uh, okay, cool. Um, so I'm just going to talk quickly, actually, I'm just going to skip ahead because I do want to make as much time as possible for the audience to ask any questions. So one of the things I'm personally quite passionate about is actually looking at how we can utilize the fact that we're all producing online learning platforms and programs to really solve some really big challenges. So we've been working quite closely with uh, Professor Yunus uh, at the UN, um, looking to really see what way meaningful way that online learning can contribute towards the UN's uh, SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. So you can see that some really important challenges here from poverty, from hunger, good health. We're talking about quality education, which is actually what we're here to do, right? What about gender equality? What can we do? I mean, if you, and a great example on that would be, you know, we've worked in projects where we're working with large infrastructural engineering companies, talking about hardcore engineering, which could be mining, etc. But the way that visually they communicate often completely is exclusive of women. So like, let's actually look at that. Let's talk about, you know, and we are in the position where we can talk about the narratives where people have succeeded and share those. We have role models in organizations, which really you can help create a platform for. And that's what's really powerful about online learning. Uh, renewable energy, and of course, you know, we can go into this, but please do check out the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's a very good start point and an inspiration for you if you do have projects in that area. And like, you know, anything from like work enforcement, again, is a great one. Uh, we're also looking at supporting a series of projects to help the refugee crisis. Um, so we'll definitely share those in the future as we get them online. Uh, but as I say, look, I mean, we're here as a community. The power of edX is not just the fact it's, it's a great technology. It's the community. For me, it was always open edX was, was the most exciting part. It's the fact that we can collaborate with partners across the world. We could work with different organizations, um, whether there is a material benefit or not. So I'm going to be really honest about some challenges. Um, it's not easy. So, you know, as I said, there was that challenge that was given to me when we started. You know, could you be a social impact organization and it not be a detriment to, your, to you as a business? Well, we've had to think harder. We've had to try and do things that are perhaps unconventional, but it's also given us a lot. Uh, but I'll be very clear, when it comes to looking at social impact in online learning, there are some real challenges. And so, firstly, is about being fit for purpose. So, going back to one of the projects I briefly mentioned earlier, where we were helping a housing association, one of the things that was really apparent in our user testing, we're talking about individuals that have ADHD. Unfortunately, uh, war veterans, rape victims, people that have been like seen the worst that the world has to offer. I'd literally spend two months going into workshops weekly. I don't, I'm a founder of a business. I've got a lot of things to do as you can, as I'm sure everyone else does. 
But then I took a second, like, what am I doing with my time? So what was interesting about the uh, feedback we were getting was that, well, why is this not like Snapchat? Why is this not like Netflix? So we do need to up our game, because otherwise we're not going to be able to capture uh, um, a section of society which already is quite busy, has challenges, and may not even have hope. So we need to really work on how we create you know, safe environments for people um, as one part of the experience, but also just that aesthetic quality to get people engaged and excited, particularly when you're dealing with millennials. Um, you know, that is very important. So the business case when you're working with organizations is quite a challenge still. So what I mean by this is we have large corporations um, that often will be thinking that this is a CSR project. Try and get away from those. Because often, yes, they are seen as a quick win if you want to create impact, but actually you should be looking at how we readdress them as a business first, which means you do have to do extra legwork. But uh, trust me, you'll be able to make a bigger change. Um, and you know, feel free to use CSR functions in organizations as your route to, but don't lean on them as your only route to success. Um, and then impact life cycle. As I say, one thing to get a course online, another thing to foster a community, but then how do we measure impact? It's a, long, it's a lot of work. So engaging with communities over three years, potentially, is, is actually a minimum requirement for you to really understand how you made a difference. But here's the thing. We're investing a lot of resources in building technology uh, and putting all this together. So actually what we should be doing is really understanding, are we making a difference or are we paying lip service uh, to something we believe has the ability to be great, well, let's make it great. So I'd love to offer, offer you the floor, and um, Olga will be um, passing out the mic, if that's okay, mm -hmm. uh, so we can capture it for our friends online, um, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was both inspiring and tangible. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go back to something you'd said early, very early in the presentation. <clears throat> But you were talking about the idea that MOOCs historically are still reaching the same demographic that's the privileged, okay? I hope I'm gotten, I got that right. Pretty close. Or yeah. generally speaking, okay? Uh, the question I would have is when you're reaching out for a social impact like this, how do you keep the content going to the right people and not just the privileged, in other words? In other words, how do you reach the audience that really needs to see this? So it's a great question. Um, so what I think is interesting is like it's actually really your um, the process in which you market and go out to you, it's almost your go to market strategy for your course. So how are you going to market? So often people will say, okay, we're with a big institution, we're going to use the funnels we know. But I think it was Einstein who said, well, you know, uh, well, with all respects, you know, if you, if you literally are doing the same process to expect the same outcome, you're kind of an idiot. Um, I mean, that's true because, like, in a sense, we have to change the way we approach. Social media, you can do a lot of targeted ads, really get focused in different areas. You can also lean on partners, which is something we've done more so, um, who already have those networks. So it depends on what your project is, who you're trying to reach. And going back to the framework we went through, um, like it's understanding your theory of change and actually what are the tools and, and you know, systems you need to get there. And so it's just a useful framework as a, you can literally do it on a blank sheet of paper, have it done in like 20 minutes. Um, but it really gives you an insight to kind of why are you doing this, how are you going to do it, who are you doing it for, and ultimately how you're going to measure. But thank you for the question. Any others? Sorry, just a could sec. we? Let me give you the mic so that um, this is actually just so that everyone knows this is live right now. Yes. And um, thank you again for speaking. Um, could we ask to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Manasvini. I'm a researcher at the Concordia University here in Montreal. Uh, you spoke about the impact cycle, which probably takes three years. So do you have any interesting stories about anything that's already happening or how it's working, anything like that at all? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've had people that have taken programs we have delivered. Um, so I'm giving you an example. Bank of England, we did a number of programs for them to help bring people into the finance industry. And you know what we did, not only in the course design, but also the way we went to market to, to the earlier question we had, was we were very selective. And so often the thing with MOOCs, the strategy is to almost try and get, I mean, depending on how you're building success, like an organization like Coursera, they literally want to get as many users as possible because it's part of their funding revenue stream. 
We have Open edX, which is a not-for-profit, so has a very different value base. Um, and so it's kind of, in a sense, um, what, I'd, what we've really found is a number of things, mainly because we've always had an approach in the way we design programs to really speak to the audience as opposed to speak to them. Um, you know, it's, it's really sort of helped people connect. And so what we've seen is we still have discussion forums still active two years on. Like, name me a MOOC that still has that. There's not often that happens. But it's kind of the way, you know, we've engaged things. Um, through to we've had people get job offers, literally, in a conversation. Or we've had people that have come back and said, well, actually, you know what? We took this program, and it actually changed my career. I've gone and moved to a different country, and I've gone and done X, Y, Z. Um, or for someone, you know, they, we even had one situation where someone actually met their life partner. Hilarious. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's, the discussion forum is a tool, just like anything else. So we've seen activity on social media. So I often will, even still today, check social media channels around courses we're running. Um, we've, of course, used the discussion forums. But then also, we do like impact evaluations every now and then, depending on the project. Um, and that's a good way of sourcing data back on what's happened and, and, and how you learn. I mean, as I say, it's, it's really being cognizant to your audience and how things are going. Uh, do we have time for one more question? I think, uh, I think we might have time for one more question. We're closing in on the 20-minute mark before your third lightning talk. Uh, if there's any other questions or... Yay! Third one's the chair. So if the market um, is targeting underprivileged, maybe, persons, how can you manage the cost for that? How can these people afford the course you're providing? Are you partnershiping with institutions that can provide help, or do they have to pay from their own pockets? And yeah. how, how is your outlook on that? Thank For you. sure. It's a great question. So it's really asking around, like, kind of what's the, almost what's the, the, the almost the entry level to, to these programs. I think it's very much, it's, it's the, I haven't got a clean answer for you. Why I say this is because every organization is different, their needs are different, and who they're trying to serve is different. So, you know, I can't give you a blanket statement of actually we should have all courses free, because actually I believe the fact that someone has paid for something is it, a material value. And so I know this from my design experience in the past is even if you get someone as a token gesture to put in like $10, the likelihood that they're actually going to value the experience plus complete is far higher. And that actually in the longer term sense, and that's why these frameworks are really powerful, is when you can start really mapping those out, you'll actually understand that actually that has a far more tangible benefit than anything else. Now, there are other ways to do this. So for example, um, we've been speaking to um, a refugee camp in, in Syria about working with um, uh, the British Council who are basically to teach English, almost like a TESOL. Um, now, what's really exciting about, and, a, and a, a, just a big shout out to British Council, the fact that they do this is incredible and they're, they're really proactive on these is amazing. Um, but actually what's interesting is that, well, they're literally funding it out of the bat. So they are, they are like EU government grants, there's American grants, um, there's pretty much all over the world, there is an opportunity for you to get some sort of grant funding to backfill what would have been the cost of production. Uh, and another way to look at it is if you're working with a large corporate entity, you know, they may took it, do a one-for-one one model. So, for example, every employee in the organization, uh, they will cover the cost for, but then they'll also give a free, almost space, to someone that actually needs it, that, that could use it perhaps even more so. So I say the exciting thing and the opportunity we have is we get to experiment and try different things. So I would not use the fact of, and I think it's a very beautiful intention you have, but let's kind of use that as a motivating force to find actually what are the uh, bits that allow. But almost what I'd suggest is it's kind of really understanding the stakeholder needs, how we're going to get them to where they need to go. And that will almost tell you the answer to what is possible and what is not. Um, and, then, and again, I want to thank you for the question. I believe we are absolutely out of time. I want to first of all thank you for being an absolutely fabulous audience. Um, and thank you for everyone that is live. Uh, we appreciate you massively. Um, feel free to get in touch. And I say I'm looking for some incredible projects and partners that we can work with. As I say, we're in the privilege of uh, helping you know, the, the, our future generations learn and be better, and even ourselves. So let's do it in the best way possible. My challenge to each and every one of you is to think about how you can create learning experiences that really create an impact. And please share. 
because I don't want this to just be one kid in the corner who you know, had no option but to do things differently because of where he came from. I want other people who have this opportunity to do even better than I can. So if there's anything I can do to help, I'm at service to you. And thank you very much, and good night. Also, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third talk of this morning. Uh, today, we're here with Raphael Droissart from uh, Learning Tribes, and he'll be speaking to us about corporate blended learning and open edX. I'll give it over to Raphael. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So um, I'm Raphael. Um, uh, first of all, thanks uh, EDX for the opportunity to um, to talk today. I will uh, I will talk today about something um, a, a little bit different than the main segment of Open EDX, which is the corporate segment of uh, of the platform. And I will talk about something very practical about how did we embed um, corporate blended learning into Open EDX, which is just a, a, a small tool that we developed. Uh, and to support a large-scale project on, on this. I apologize in advance for the French accent from France. Um, so yeah, 20 minutes, then uh, 10 minutes of questions, right? OK. Um, so just to give, yeah, just to give a little bit of context on, the, on, the, on what, what we are doing. So Learning Tribes is an L&D organization. So we don't own content. We don't have on the shelves content. We, design customized training uh, from from face to face to online to uh, to diverse clients in the world and um, um, how we use open edx so um, now three years that we 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 contribute and we use open edx um, to support uh, we don't sell open edx we use open edx to support all the content that we create for our clients and we think that open edx right now is the the best product with our vision to support our vision in uh, during our, our project um, yeah so globally we support a large-scale project uh, on, on diverse diverse culture and, and on diverse continents um, so now if uh, I'm giving more and more context on the on the, the situation um, blended learning so I'm, I'm sure every one of you already knows just to give you uh, uh, some context about what I'm talking about so blended learning is a mix uh, between di different uh, learning modalities uh, and uh, so of course there is online self-blended uh, flex and, and and different kind what i'm talking about today is the maybe the more uh, simple but <laughs> complex for for for, for corporates uh, way to do blended learning which is a mix between ilt uh, courses and online courses and and put all of them together in a, in a korean way um, so this is what I will focus during this um, business case I want to share with you, which is mix between ILT and online. Um, okay, so corporate blended learning, uh, what are the, the main, uh, let's say, benefits? I mean, today more and more um, companies investing on, on blended learning solutions, blended learning things, which is not the easiest to, uh, to set up uh, internally for, for, for our employees. So, but at the end, um, I think it was it. Um, we, uh, I'm, I'm very lucky to uh, to work uh, to work with learning tribes with with more than 100 clients, and so we have a lot of business case, a lot of uh, visions of companies about how they see trainings, how they uh, what's their strategies, and and how they adapt to their operational uh, constraints. So, first of all. Uh, for blended learning, what's the, the main benefits? We all run business here. It's the main benefit is to cutting some cost without losing quality of, of the training. So blended learning is actually, it's actually doing this. Um, we, have, um, we have lots of clients asking us, OK, we have a new IR training program for, for two months, and we have uh, attrition like more than 50%. So the cost of this training is, is very huge, and, and so the, our our problems is how we could like reduce one or two days of this of this program, and then worldwide in the global co in global companies, the co the cost saved is actually huge at the end. And blended learning is a way to put more content online, linking with with the uh, offline training that um, lots of companies are already doing, and, and then reducing the numbers of our in class um, and and. Um, rising the number of our online. Um, so that, that's, a, let's say, I, I think that's a main um, motivation for companies to uh, embed blended learning. Um, it's also a way to, dem to demonstrate ARI um, for, the, for the training and, and improve also the, the financial allocation to, um, to it. 
Um, second, I think second benefits of blended learning is that flexibility. Uh, we have more flexibility in the, in the, the staff resources that uh, we might allocate to, to some trainings. Um, so the anytime, anywhere that uh, we are hearing now for a few times is actually, uh, it's actually true with blended learning. Learners are more, flex are more flexible, to, flexible to, to, um, to go online whenever they want, according, of course, um, and the, the, the corporate policy in terms of compliance for, for this kind of platform. Uh, we have few clients that doesn't still um, doesn't allow to, to learn outside of the working office, but the trend is that mo it's more and more open, so um, which actually the flexibility will become more and more efficient in the future. Um, deployment also uh, is more flexible for learners, for instructors on this side to, uh, to create uh, training, to organize training and to deploy what they, what they want to teach within large-scale organizations. Um, third, uh, third thing, uh, which is linked with uh, the OpenEDX product, is the, the collaborative aspect of training. We know that, we all know that training is actually a social act. This is what made training efficient. This is why uh, today uh, companies are still doing a lot of ILT in-class training because there is really a social aspect of the, of the training which, which engaged the learner, which is what we lost a little bit with e-learning when, when it appears like um, 10 years ago. And, and using OpenEDX, using a um, new uh, digital collaborative tool will continue uh, the, the, the class um, after uh, the course in a, a digital learning platform. Some discussions and, uh, and, and things. Uh, it's also a great, a great way to share digital uh, offering online uh, after the training and, and let the learner continue, get feedbacks, and, and, and learn more about what they learn in class. We know that most of the learner forget everything uh, of what they learn when they, they, they get to the job because sometimes it's hard to transcript and uh, what they learn in the, in the job. So this is also a great way to have access uh, to a platform where they can um, review and, and, and try to apply more and more about what they learned before. Last one, it's, it's innovations. Um, blended learning brings really uh, innovations in, the, in the, the way that we are training people. So of course what just, just said is that we, we now uh, embedded more and more digital learning um, tools. Uh, during the training, so it's, bring, uh, it's bringing a little bit of innovations. We incorporate also new technologies. I'm talking about adaptive learning, big worlds now. Uh, so uh, it's also a way to innovate more and more in the training. All right, so that was just uh, the context and what I, I'm, I think about what's the benefits of the corporate learning learning today. Um, just an example, because we are, I, I will present a business case right now. So this. Just to give a little bit of context again, this business case is, is my academy. It's, it's a 75,000 people uh, learning program to a, a very operational, from, a, from onboarding to operational training. So what, what we have here is that different types of, of jobs and during, for each jobs, they have like each learning pass is actually maybe between one and a half year to, uh, to two years learning pass. And, and in this learning pass, they have a mix between classes and um, digital and digital learning activities, um, which is great, and, and this is uh, we just explain after why we choose OpenEDX and why we believe in blended learning. This is now there is one only one place for a learner in a company to access all his learning offering, and so um, more and more companies now are, are trying to tackle the digital learning part with e-learning now with MOOC. Uh, which is um, and growing very, very fast in the corporate environment. And, um, but they, on the other way, they have their uh, traditional way of manage um, um, ILT class. Um, and, and so we need to centralize everything in one platform to make only one door for an employee today to access all the learning. Uh, so what was on the, on the ILT, um, so what we developed actually based on that is just a, a quick tool to um, really um, manage the ILT class inside OpenEDX. So a quick analysis of what was the need on that. From the learner perspective, so what I say is just one place for all the learning offerings. Um, it was also for the learner itself to monitor his, uh, his training, uh, where is he, uh, what he needs to do, what he needs to complete, 
uh, sooner or later. And, and flexibility is also a need from the learner um, to bring in more flexibility in the, in the ILT class. On the instructor way, which is what LMS are doing great, it's the, the way that we can manage training. Uh, on, the on the instructor way, we need to manage um, stations easily, uh, especially when you have a lot, a lot of LND managers which needs to create stations and manage stations. Um, very, very important, the, the, the famous attendance sheet in the corporate training environment where we need to validate the attendance of, of my learners. Um, the instructor also wants now to share, ability to share learning materials online to, to continue the training after the class and get feedbacks. Feedbacks are important. The assessment sheets of, of the training is, is well famous, but sometimes not well enough centralized and well enough analyzed. So um, this is important. And of course, what LMS are still doing great right now, it's, it's monitor the learners' activities and the learners' um, performance itself. So now if I'm talking about the products, Open EDX, um, I mean, we, uh, we started like digital learning in learning tribes uh, five years ago now, five, six years ago. Um, the questions, as we are not a software provider, the question at first was with who we are going to partner to support all the, the content that we are producing now. And uh, the first choice was like partner with the traditional learning management system thing, but the vision that we had in, in the institutional design that we tried to bring in learning tribes was not compatible with the way the learning management system is behaving and the way the software is built. And this is where maybe four years ago we met OpenEDX uh, with, with the um, very famous Harvard courses at that time that I said, okay, let's, let's try to, to follow this MOOC and see how it goes. And uh, even now, it's much more optimized than, uh, um, than before. I think the first time we saw Open EDX, we say, yeah, wow, well, this is what we need because it's, it's collaborative. It's going to really continue the, um, the, the training and it's going to bring the, uh, a lot of authoring tools, uh, very cool things, which is the studio when you can really uh, embed not, not only SCORM things, which is actually we're not putting SCORM anymore in learning trials, but really embed videos, a lot of cool stuff inside the training. So, um, so if now the platform right now is, is the front end of, of our platform that we, we call Tribu for the, for the marketing. Um, so when I go inside the course, which is actually learning paths that we, uh, I just showed before on the map, um, I, I will go to the ILTX block. So it's um, ILTX block is the X block we built um, compatible with OpenEDX to allow, um, let's say, ILT class management system directly inside OpenEDX, directly inside the course. So what's the objective of this X block? Uh, so organize face-to-face -face sessions inside OpenEDX. I just push the block somewhere in the course between two videos, between two quizzes. And then um, when I push the blocks, I can, I'm able to uh, create stations ILT class with a lot of details, who's going to give the class, how many seats I have during the class, what's the name, what's the instructor, what's the lens. Uh, so basic detail of it. So we can manage also seat and wait list, uh, which is important for, 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 for companies to, um, to manage their class. And um, student, inter inter uh, so, sorry, student interaction. So, um, basically, what the students can do is that he can register for a session, he can add the sessions to his calendar in, in Outlook, so keep record and get reminder, and he also have internal mail, mail reminder for the, um, for the sessions. And on the other, on the other um, the hand, the, the instructor uh, can interact also with the, with the ILTX block, and so he can enroll people to it, and we just show after a demo, and, and manage the, um, um, the sessions and validate the completions of the, of the sessions. Let's, let's, let's take a look about how it looks. So this is what you show on the, uh, the um, lower part of the, the screen, is that we have this block, which is giving information to the, to the learner about what the session's about with all the informations and just two choice to uh, uh, enroll the sessions, unenroll the sessions and add the, uh, the sessions to my calendar. This is the uh, learner view, very simple, just, you know, uh, and on the chapter three, on the week three of this, of this uh, uh, digital learning program, I have a quick sessions which could be in class, which could be also live. There is a way, uh, like locations, uh, oh, and actually what's, what's in here, location is actually a link to, to follow uh, Adobe Connect sessions or Zoom, Zoom sessions, but it could be a physical address also. On the instructor view, 
And so that's just the a lower part also of it. The instructor can just access the course he's, uh, he's managing and then enroll people directly in the course because not everyone <laughs> wants to participate to a course. Sometimes the, ma the LMD manager needs to push employees to uh, go to the course to uh, really train themselves so they can enroll and enroll people as they want, uh, also bulk enrollments, and they can download the, the CSV list of the the learners enrolled in the sections. Um, on the last part, which is actually making the, the real link with, with uh, the features of OpenEDX, once the CSV has been downloaded, the learner, the, the instructor can just mark all the list of the people if they're here or not and re-upload the CSV in the platform, which is validate completions. If the, if the sections of, of these courses is linked with, is graded, linked with badge or linked with um, with, with, uh, with, um, which is graded, uh, it can you know, validate the grade and then being one step, validate one step in the, in the course. And so it can go after to other digital or both ILT class. So that's, the, that's the, the thing. So if I can sum up a little bit with, with a demo, so I go to my course, um, then once I'm in the course, I will have my learning contents. Um, I can watch videos, answer quizzes like the survey uh, before the learning strat. I just enroll, choose my sessions, enroll and enroll as I want. So we are flexible to choose different sessions. If my, my calendar doesn't allow this one, I can, can register another one. Um, so I enroll, I download my, my, my ICS invitations to, um, to keep it in my, my um, corporate agenda. And um, on, the other, on the other way, uh, if I'm an instructor, so here in the instructor view, I can just enroll someone in EDX with their email address or with their username, uh, which is very convenient. Um, and then uh, download the, the CSV of, uh, of learners uh, enrolled in the course. So very simple, um, very, very simple too, but which is actually allowing um, in, the, in this business case, we have closely 5,000 LND managers in 22 countries. So it's very powerful for them to have just one place where they can create their sessions themselves, um, and enroll people in it, and really self manage their, their learning um, offering. I'm talking about here, yeah, this company is a, a call center, a BPO company. So they have lots of people in the call center, and they need really this flexibility to interact with the training. OK, so now. This, this is just, um, has been released very, very, um, very lately. So uh, we, uh, we, will, we are still testing. It's in the beta versions and, and we'll be ready to maybe share with the community and, and have more people bringing their, um, their vision on it and improve the tool. Uh, what, what's next for this, um, for this X block? We want to embed more and more features in it. So the first one, which is integrate the ILT class within the reporting tools of OpenEDX. So in, in Tribu, in Learning Trust, we are using an internal analytics tool, but it could be also embedded in, in, um, in uh, OpenEDX Insights uh, to get data and to get reports about the class. Um, very important, and this is a, a big constraint for us, is uh, the HRS um, compatibility of this because companies and, and the bigger they are, the more, um, the more hard they uh, they are to get you know, data and they want to keep their internal tools. So the idea is also to feed their uh, human resource uh, system, management system to uh, get data directly in their internal tools. Uh, what we want to do is also bring more and more notifications about uh, the tool itself where, where the time is changed. Today, um, today the, the tool will just tell you, okay, you've been enrolled in these sessions or you've been enrolled to these sessions. Tomorrow we want to also monitor more things like the time has changed, the place, has, the location has changed. This is on the roadmap. Um, managing waitlist for learners is good because sometimes just only 20 seats limited when, when, when all 20 people book the place and um, the one after can't register, but the turnover is actually high in this class, someone will cancel, so uh, waitlist is important for learner. And uh, one interesting one, which is uh, actually I didn't say, but I'm based in Shanghai, China, where, where we are leading the, um, let's say, the development of, of learning tribes for the digital and for the, the instructional design. And uh, so China is definitely, um, more mobile market than Europe and the US right now. And so um, what we want to do is that learners automatic check 
in the course with a QR code, so the tools could just generate a QR code. They all take their mobile, they scan it, and up automatically they they have their antennas registered. So that could be also one one cool features we have on the roadmap. Um, and then uh, I don't know if you heard about very uh, yesterday. I heard that Klaxoon, the, the French startup that is bringing more and more digital tools inside the IELTS class, it just raised 50 million dollars to uh, to grow and it's in interesting for us also to partner with those companies to um, just uh, have the tools available in the IT class and make it available for the for the trainers. Uh, so that's also something we will dig in uh, in the future on the roadmap is to integrate some content push, some tools that uh, animate the training um, of, the, of the instructor. Um, another thing interesting is the time zone improvement. We have a few, uh, few things to do when you manage like different time zone uh, things. Um, different countries, sorry, uh, the time zone is important to, to manage and integrates more and more, um, have a better integrations with Adobe Connect and Zoom, which are um, very famous tools that lots of companies are, are using. So that's the, the roadmap, that's the next development that we want to bring to the ILT and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, that was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Please raise your hand and I'll give you the microphone. Please note that our session is live. I would ask you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Cross from Tokyo Institute of Technology. You said you're based in Shanghai, China. So yeah. do you have uh, lang er Training in various languages, or do you concentrate in English, or try to localize to the, the local environment? No, no, we try to, to localize to the local environment. So the the Apple EDX version is actually uh, natively supported Chinese. So we just change um, just a little things on the platform, and then everything we develop can be uh, localized in, in China. So, for example, the text would be in Chinese. Yeah. And then the instructor would be speaking Chinese. Yeah. For, for ch can be. Okay. Yeah. The instructor is free to create his own sessions, so mm -hmm. sometimes our own project manager will help them to help our clients to manage their sessions, but the tools want to be like self-managed by the instructor, uh, where he can himself create, delete a session, so he can do it in, in whatever the, the language he wants, just a, 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 as long as the, the platform is supporting the, the language. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. I saw a hand on this side of the room. I'm going to have to come up with questions myself. I can ask a question. Yeah. Um, what would you say was your biggest challenge in your most recent project? Our most recent project? The example project. For the, uh, for the ILT? Yes. Well, the challenge is really when you do it at, uh, at large scales with a lot of people, um, there is training is, uh, tra training is <laughs> the constraint, yeah. We need to uh, educate those learning and, and development uh, managers to use the tools and, and then to, uh, um, to really create more and more sessions to manage the, the platform itself. Um, so communication when you are doing large scale projects like this is, is actually um, a challenge. a question over here. Hi, I'm Michelle Lockard with Global Knowledge. How do you handle the scheduling of sessions for your blended learning? Are there, is that, like, what's the overall framework? Do you have some of your on-demand courses that you take within edX and then you have a live session? Are they scheduled up front so the users have to pick what time slot they want up front or is it not until they get into the on-demand session where they have options to choose the live sessions? Yeah, so there is different options definitely. So. Mm, some courses like this, they are like running for, for many years, so they are kind of on-demand um, courses, self-paced courses could be. But um, with this business case, we actually have um, an auto-enrollment script that based on the, the job code or based on the, the, the position of the guy will be auto-enrolled to do this learning path. And then based on that, all the courses are, are, are timed to, uh, um, to just run, and, and then the instructor itself can you know, create five sessions where you say, okay, during those five sessions, I will, I will 
go on this topic, which w was here, like was project management, for example, and then the learner itself is free to choose one session to register and go. So can be this way, it can also be only one session, and, and in that case, we need to communicate a little bit better to the, the learner itself to uh, say, okay, and this se there is only one session, so make yourself available to this kind of management, but really, f oh, and, and this is the great advantage of, of OpenEDX, you're free to manage your courses as you want. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, one more question. Actually, I, I used to work at Fujitsu in Tokyo, working um, for technology development. One of the things I remember experiencing when I was working at the company is we would have uh, training sessions sometimes to p mix Japanese and international people together, which is, you know, sy synergy, trying to create yep. synergy between the two different um, employees. And I can remember going to training and get a real buzz out of training and feeling really good. I, I learned something new, very active. But as you said, then you go back to where your office is and you forget everything or yeah. everything's the same as it was before you went to training. So do you have any interactions with those who go to training after they go back to the office to follow up or try to encourage them or some activities? Yeah, so I think there is two ways to see the thing. There is the first way, which is purely managed uh, the managers to uh, bring like uh, micro coaching to the, their, their teams after the training. So, which, which I'm coming back to the monitoring things because the managers of a team needs to know who did what and when. And, and this is one trend we are working on is there is too much like sales director. If I take a sales director, it will tell you what do you need uh, for training? I said, oh, I need to train my, my sales guy to, uh, to sell more and to sell better. Yeah, but technically what do you do? And they don't know. And so with, with the, the way to, we build courses, we can just specifically target uh, skills, which is, I don't know, like, um, like product, um, specific uh, training about the product that you're selling, and then bring monitoring to the manager about these things. And then after you can say, okay, this guy completed, so now I will try to bring a little bit of coaching. So this is a new, not a new, but this is uh, something which is important for the manager is to monitor the activity of the team and then interact with them. That's the first one. On the, the, the second one, which and this is where blending learning is great, is that we, we just put the ILT class, then after we put two other sequences where we'll put videos, uh, external um, infography or external resources that they can get into, or even a quiz to validate the resources that they have to do like one week before, and then we say, okay, we will open this quiz one week after the, the, the training, so you need to go there, and so we communicate to the learner itself, then they will rework a little bit what they learned during the, the ILT class on the platform. So that's good to have the follow-up, right? That, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. We have time for a couple more questions. Uh, there's a question in the back. Hi, I'm Rowan from Cloudera. Uh, so which, um, for, for actually running the sessions, which software does this work with? You mentioned you wanted to get a better integration with Adobe Connect and Zoom, but like wh which softwares could we use with this? So basically today you just have um, a new URL field that you need to, uh, to fill when you're creating the station, which is what's the location of your training. And uh, so there is, you're right, there is tons of different softwares that we could work on and I can't control what company and what client is using what. So basically we just give them simple way to copy past the, the link of their, their station inside the tools then because the employee are the, the main uh, stakes order of the, of the training, so they already have access to the Adobe Connect using SSO or whatever, so um, this, is, this is how we do today. But um, I have lots of requests from clients where they want to have the, I don't know, if maybe it's kind of psychological thing, but they want to have the, the, the live tools embedded in the platform itself, in iframe or whatever, and so the, the, the idea would be to work with the API of Doom or the API of Adobe Connect, which we identified as the, the two tools that um, most of our clients are working on. So we will try to work with this API to, uh, to build directly uh, um, a framework inside the, uh, the platform. Thank you so much. Um, is there a last volunteer? I have a, if not, I have a choose your adventure question. 
Um, could you speak a little bit about the requests your client have, have for your roadmap or about adaptive? So adaptive, you mentioned? like adap a real adaptive learning concept. Okay, so this we're gonna take for, uh, one more hour. <laughs> no, the, so what's the request of our clients today? Um, so they, they, they want their training more and more uh, short. They want the sequence to be more and more shorter. Um, so adaptive, yes. Uh, it's not adaptive learning, it's more personalized learning, like branching system where, okay, this guy needs to do this and this and that. Actually, it's very simple to, to deploy those kind of things, like we're taking what's the code, uh, the, the corporate code of the guy, then if it's this code is registered to this learning path, then you, c you can use the prerequisite courses features of OpenEDX to say you need to complete this, or even the learning plans, which we are not using yet, but this is on the roadmap. Um, so we could do uh, things like this. After going to real adaptive learning, this is a project we have right now in Shanghai. Um, but it's, it's much more complex. It requires much more external, external resources to, uh, um, than OpenEDX is already offering right now, so it's, it's another topic, but yeah, and the idea would be okay, okay to use like the, the learning science uh, and to work on the, on the data uh, from our learner to, in one objective, or, or from, from what I see and from what my clients request, is that make the training shorter for the people that already know uh, the stuff. And one example which is totally true is the compliance training. Every year you need to take the compliance training. And so you take it one year, it takes 40 minutes. Then the second year with the score module is still taking 40 minutes. And with adaptive learning, if you go like quizzes and quiz answers, resources, this kind of, of schema, you can reduce the, co the, the time uh, of the training like 60, 70%, which the, the guy who knows the, the resources will directly uh, complete the training um, and so the engagement and the satisfaction is better. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, the next session is lunch. So um, please follow the directions. Thank you. Thank you.